A very warm welcome to OBN Horn of Africa. This is our weekly program, Future Africa, and I'm Phantom Belete hosting this program. Today, I'm joined by Dawit Tafari, political activist from Canada, to discuss insecurity in the Horn of Africa. Till the end of our program, stay with us. Dawit, thank you for joining me and welcome to this program. Thank you for inviting me, Fantahun. I'm excited to be here and to speak to my fellow um, Horn Africans and to European audience to, you know, let them know there's other perspective in the Horn. Thank you very much. Before going to our discussion, would you tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, well, my name is Dawit Ferry. I was born in Sudan um, in the 80s. Uh, um, I grew up there because if there was a situation that you probably know, the war was going on in Ethiopia against the Dirk regime. And uh, my father is Eritrean. My mother is actually Ethiopian from the region of Tigray. Uh, nonetheless, I was uh, I grew up there. I after independence, we were going back and forth between Eritrea and Sudan. It's a long story. Obviously, a lot of issues happened, um, and then uh, as a result, we migrated to Canada um, 17 years ago, and I've been living since then. I'm a business owner. I own um, I'm a CPA by trade, and I'm a, I own a construction business as well. And I am an Eritrean activist, part of the Blue Revolution, Begin Hamadou. Um, I act, I'm active on Plan A. Um, I work on, uh, on Canada and global activities as well. Um, so I took this opportunity to reach out to, um, to my fellow Horn Africans and um, to Europeans specifically to speak to them about our view about what's going on. Great. As I've said before, we are here to discuss uh, the insecurity in the Horn of Africa. To begin with, what do you perceive as Egypt's primary motivations for military engaging in Somalia as recently observed? Well, here I think, um, um, e Egypt have a natural, um, since um, the dawn of time, it seemed to be an unfortunate situation where Ethiopia and Egypt are, are the fault lines from long time ago. Um, and I think the main reason for them is always the word about the development in the Nile Basin and especially uh, the guard. And they've been vocal about it. I speak Arabic. They're very vocal about it. They're very dramatic about it. Um, and I remember in uh, 2011, and you know, in the height of building the dam, you know, I have Egyptian friends who were like, "How come? How dare they are?" But really funny. I remember I had a conversation with an Egyptian, and he told me like, "You as an Egyptian, you should be like, you know, we should work together in in making sure you know Ethiopia is destroyed or something like that." I was like, "Why? Ethiopians have the right to their land. They could do whatever they want. They need to work with you. You cannot suffocate people." Uh, they're not, they're not, should not do that, but we should look at a different way of view. Um, I don't want to really dwell on a, in one individual's um, conversation, but if you look historically, uh, my beloved country, Eritrea, um, Egypt have played a very important role in supporting our independence ask from Ethiopia. Now, Ishias Afoki notoriously said in 1993, their goal was not because they loved us, just was to create instability for Ethiopia. And that's essentially what, what, was the plan. And, you know, we've seen even with the current Tigray war, I, if you listen to Arabic, they were like looking forward to support um, uh, any insurgency to help uh, destabilize Ethiopia. And ultimately the goal is Ethiopia not to develop any dams on the uh, on Nile. Now, all nations have interests. Sometimes we will have conflicts, but I think one thing that we should learn from the Europeans they fought themselves among themselves for so many years, and this has not led them to realize the best way is to talk about it, make fair deals, correct? Right? And I think that's essentially what probably the Egyptians have to get around. And Ethiopia is a, have a have a right to use the the water that comes from its land, but they have the right to use the water because they depend on it. And Ethiopia does not need the water. Ethiopia needs the hydropower. And essentially, that's the gap here. Because remember, like um, every a failed dictator always takes a snip, snippet of a problem and they make it to a national issue. But right now, Egypt have its own economic issues. They should be focused on making deals with the neighbors. Um, and as we know now, the situation is even more dire because what's going on in Sudan. So I, I'm answering it from a bigger perspective. I think. Um, uh, 
people have to realize um, that uh, the Nile is the lifeline for Ethiopia, for Egypt, and Egypt needs to have control. But I think Egypt's view of controlling uh, the Nile should be about cooperating with Ethiopia rather than creating conflicts, because ultimately that's not going to lead to any situation because the same thing can happen. We've seen Sudan now engulfed in a, a civil war. The war is if in your doorstep and the doorstep of Ethiopia, things can change. So nobody's going to win. But it's better for us to focus on uh, bringing a better perspective. And I think they have a legitimate, they have a legitimate request. I'm, I'm, I think everybody have the legitimate reasons to feel threatened. However, the best way is to work together. Um, and the involvement um, in Somalia, just, I think it's an extension of that episode. Uh, we will expand on that as, as we, the discussion continues. Egypt has been a playing proxy war in the Horn of Africa. Can you give us specific examples of the actions that Egypt has taken so far to destabilize the Horn of Africa, please? Uh, here's the thing, uh, Van Dahoun. I, I, uh, we can obviously, at the end of the day, it just, um, I, I, um, we know, for example, we're doing this Eritrean Liberation Front. Um, now, for me as an Eritrean, we benefited from that. Obviously, um, unfortunately, somebody's misfortune somebody sometimes is somebody's fortune in, in one way, as, as direct as possible. However, uh, during the last, uh, the war in Tigray, um, you could see, you know, the Jewish were very excited about the whole situation. And I'm like, okay, obviously, it, all of us have a different view about that war, and I'm sure that war was an ugly one. I'm sure nobody can deny that, but you could tell like, they were looking for opportunities and how to make sure the, con the conflict. Now, I'm not saying this is an official position of the Egyptian government, because I, I cannot, one cannot, I, there's no real official statement, but you could see from the analysts, from the media, how they spoke about the conflict. Um, uh, I would say to you, um, in, in one way, um, the media, for example, as in the Eritrean, um, the Eritrean regime trolls, they, they can look like, oh, there's an alliance between Egypt and Somalia and Eritrea to, to kind of like um, uh, uh, surround uh, Ethiopia somehow and isolate it and somehow there's an alliance. So that's where I get my in, intuition. And we have seen trips from ECS and Osman Saleh is, FM uh, going there and you see this activity. Now you can, it looks like it, now it could be, uh, uh, but one, it, Egyptian media have been very clear about that if you, uh, Egypt have to act on creating proxy wars, either supporting even the Oromo back in the day, uh, you know, the Oromo um, Liberation uh, Front. Liberation Front, um, wherever opposition groups to continue to engulf Ethiopia into a a fight a war. Um, now, when I say this guy, I, I want to make sure to your uh, audience, the ask of those people, those the Oromo people or the Eritrea, people of Eritrea back in, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, or the Tigray, wherever it is, there could be a legitimate reason for that. However, we don't need to, I'm not talking about the legitimacy of the ask. That's not my what I'm trying to say. But the reality is we have to uh, uh, understand the interests of some of the, the um, uh, non-regional powers would be only to influence the po politics uh, of the region and to achieve a bigger goal. And I think the bigger goal for a country like Egypt is to make sure none of the countries in the Horn of Africa develop. Because if we start developing, we're going to start looking at our natural resources and how to use it. That includes Eritrea. Uh, I, I don't want to really divert to Eritrea in this question here, but when we go back, for example, um, uh, my fellow Eritreans get really upset when the Ethiopian government speak about the Red Sea. But guess what? Ethiopia gave Assad to the Emiratis to use it as a base to bomb Yemen. So that was not an issue. But it's an issue when the Ethiopian says, well, you know, I need an access to the sea to have some political influence. So like, what's the issue for you? Okay. Is it, is it, are you consistently against every foreign country to have access to your coast? If that's the case, why not? be the same uh, apprehensive or angry when it, the Emiratis do the same thing or the Chinese speak about Assad, correct? So same thing goes back to the Somali issue. So we need to really understand who the non-regional powers will use our differences, wherever they are, they could be legitimate to make us fight more. The question is, should we fight more? 
maybe we should look at way, ways to move forward. That's kind of like the view I have. I'm sorry I'm jumping different questions at the same time, but as they come natural to me. How does Egypt's interference affect the overall uh, security landscape in the Horn of Africa, particularly uh, regarding conflicts in Somalia and Ethiopia? Uh, absolutely. I would say um, e Egypt coming in, if they wanted to be part of the um, uh, African um, uh, peacekeeping mission, uh, they could participate. But the way they're entering, it looks like they are like supporting um, uh, uh, one side to fight another side in Somalia for other political aim. That for me sound like somebody trying to create a mayhem, right? So uh, the Somalia uh, or Somaliland, they have 30 years of conflict. I think 33 actually, 30, we had the Somali civil war and it's like 50 years. It's a long time. These people need a break, right? And that you want, that's not the way to approach it. Um, I think I was watching an interview with, um, I miss keeping uh, writing down his name, the general that uh, on uh, an American base in Djibouti, and he was speaking about Ethiopia's role in being an important player when it comes to keep peacekeeping in his, in the region, and especially specifically Somalia. So, uh, so if that is really working, so what's the point of coming? For that, uh, where they're coming now? And as I said. There's this conflict been going on, this this uh, uh, instability in Somalia been going on for a very long time. So to say that Egypt just suddenly now discovers Somalia in the map and they want to really go back and help the so uh, Somalis, it could be, but it's highly unlikely based on the, um, the current analysis. How do you view the relationship between Egypt and Eritrea? And in what ways do you think this alliance impacts Ethiopia and uh, the broader region? I'll go back and answer it with a little bit more, not historical perspective, but from a perspective of, of reality of ECS regime. So ECS regime makes deals when it's only about conflict. If it's, if it's about peace, it's not, he's not interested, right? Um, so uh, the current movement is just odd because um, it's only intended to create this perception that, hey, um, I'm not happy with Ethiopia, so I'm going to go bring Egypt and I'm going to rally Egypt into getting involved in this region and stuff like that. At least that's what we see from the analysts, from their uh, um, media uh, uh, propaganda coming in out of the Eritrean supporters. Um, uh, uh, there is no strategic goal here because uh, 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 Eritrea... Um, it's a sovereign country and in Egypt it is. Um, I don't know what Israel's alliance would be because they don't have anything to trade in among themselves. Um, maybe it's a defense pact between the two countries. Um, it doesn't look like it, but I would say to you, it's more of it like um, uh, the Eritrean regime attempt to draw attention to itself and to perhaps to show strength or uh, to send a, a message to people in the region or to Ethiopia specifically saying uh, we, we, we have alien alliances or we have friends in the region. Um, that looks like in Egypt, it's uh, normally they want to show that, hey, we are in the region, we can wreak havoc. But I don't think there's a substance to this because we know no ETS cannot have a long-term relationship, no matter what. Maybe you're too young, but uh, I have seen him kissing, uh, uh, sharing a champagne with Mendes and then with El Bashir. And he always have a fight with everybody. So I, I won't count. It's just a temporary alignment for now. To what extent do you believe uh, Egypt is utilizing proxy groups or alliances to undermine Ethiopia's uh, influence in the region? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, and that goes, uh, that goes as well to the, to the, uh, to the, to the, um, to the current political environment. Um, I, I believe what's happening is just they are interfering in a topic that they don't really have anything, any economic impact, uh, benefit from, except to create instability. So uh, if you go to the media, they're not very ashamed about talking about, hey, we should prop all opposition groups and stuff like that to keep Ethiopia in a turmoil. Um, that goes back to my, uh, to our, um, you know, uh, Eritrea, that's, I think that's very clear that um, the Eritrean regime uh, enjoys interfering in, in, in uh, Ethiopian affairs and as well as 
Egypt. So it's just the using the current, the, all the tools around them to create a situation where they engulf Ethiopia in some sort of a strife that will lead them to achieve the goal of Ethiopia not progressing. It looks like it to me, obviously. Uh, I'm not saying Egypt's an evil player. Uh, absolutely, they could be a positive player. It's just a matter of that's what it seemed to be at this point. How has the historical uh, context of Eritrea's independence shaped its current foreign policy, particularly in relation to Egypt and Ethiopia? Okay, that's actually, um, I, I like this question because I would like to answer it with a bit of philosophical uh, perspective because I want to. So Eritrea um, as a country, um, uh, we, uh, we, when we were like fighting for independence, Egypt was playing a, a pivotal role, especially in the early stages, in um, harboring some of the our what we call them founding fathers to speak ab about independence and what uh, what not, which is um, at the time was very helpful. But then during that period, there was this kind of ideological shift in, to create in what you call Eritrea, because Eritrea. As, you know, at the end of the day, countries have formed because of political events, with the colonialism, wherever it is. Um, there was like a real big push to, in order for Eritreans to fight hard, it, there's a lot of issues, but you have to create this national uh, identity around, hey, everything Ethiopian is bad, Ethiopia is our enemy, and that's it. So in order to make you me fight hard, I had to create a national identity that's just different and is just pounding anything that's ancient or traditional. Um, Egypt did not play a role in this, it's just a historical perspective. So today we're left with a, a part of a nationalism that's beyond just regular nationalism, being proud of your country, trying to build it, having the reason why it exists, beyond to that, hey, I just hate this person because he's my enemy, because he's my enemy. Oh, because of this, they will look back and say Ethiopian colonialism, but then they don't talk about Italian colonialism, or they don't talk about why this is the atrocity that's happening, why it happened. So um, that so this era created this um, national uh, psychology where it likes to stay in conspiracy, uh, and they think that somehow the super monster sitting there to eat us, to gobble us and eat us into, and then we're going to be annexed again by Ethiopia. However, the question is, when you compare Eritrea with Somaliland, I like Ethiopians. Ethiopians, they sat down on the table and said, okay, do you want to go out? Okay, go. Do you offend them? Bye-bye. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Where Somalilanders, very unfortunate for them, they're stuck with Somalia, who cannot live with them in one house. They cannot work with them. They cannot give them independence. And they still they want to fight them. Even though they cannot even control the territory they have, there is no unity there within the territory they're talking about. So uh, we never really appreciate each other very well, correct? Okay? So I'm telling you this is from genuine. Yeah, there's a lot of historical problems we have with Ethiopia for a very long time. But reality is, you know, Ethiopians, at some point they became logic as, okay, you don't want to live with us? Okay, bye, go. And you don't want to give us an answer? It's fine, we will go to Djibouti. That's fine. Ethiopia was able to progress without having to access to the sea through Eritrea. So where, why I have to continue thinking Ethiopia is my enemy? Until when? That's the gap we have. Now, Egypt is just really an external player. They have their own intentions. We just have, but our core problem, is, at least from the Eritrean perspective, is this um, uh, fascist nationalism that's causing yeah. us not to move forward. Given the ongoing uh, border tensions in the region, how do you envision uh, resolving these disputes without resorting to armed conflict? I, I, I think it's very important for us, this border conflict, we just remember, these borders were created for the most part through colonial powers. None of the people discussed it. And people demographic change. But we can learn again from the Europeans that we should not be fighting about colonial borders. We should be fighting on how to have the best GDP per capita for our citizens in each respective country. We are tired. It's been my time, your life. We cannot have another generation go through an unwanted war. If God, anybody have an enemy in this region, but the reality is we have to look at what we have in common 
and to build a relationship. So uh, basically what we could do is always be creative. We have seen in, in Europe where you have countries like uh, Switzerland, Hungary, where they have deals with the co countries around them. Ethiopia is blessed with a big population, with a big, with the gods completed, it, be, it should become a manufacturing hub for prime goods. So should we continue blocking access to natural resources or should we be the gate point to one of the biggest economies that could be built? So that's where we want to focus on. So the success of Ethiopia could become really important for the country's neighboring, which is Eritrea, Djibouti, Somaliland, Somalia, wherever it is, how the political landscape will be. All our neighbors, we should work together in building an economic hub and we should compete on creating a better uh, economic livelihood. And we look and look at it's like, hey, I have something and you have something. Can we sit down and agree on things and how should be worked on? And we should not get emotional here. If you need access to the sea, it is natural because you need to ship stuff. I have, but I have at the same time as a, as a Eritrean, I, I might have discomfort because, oh, maybe they're trying to annex my land, but I should not have that discomfort because if the messaging coming from Ethiopia is, hey, let's work together, and, that's the, and that should be the message for all of us from both sides. And that goes from Eritrea to, to, um, to Ethiopia, uh, and Ethiopia to Djibouti, Ethiopia to Somalia or Somaliland, or wherever we want to, <laughs> because we don't, <coughs> we have to ac accept all different political alternatives. However, it is, it is most, the most stupid argument I ever hear now that we want to go and fight another war. It just makes no sense. Because any analyst will look at this and say, like, this is make no sense because we already tried all those wars. Let's just try a different alternative. Let's have stability um, in the region. And now to have stability, we don't need a lot of old people to be in power with 30, 40, 50 years of anger issues who cannot move forward. And that's the biggest issue here. Uh, uh, that's kind of like, you know, that's kind of my view. How can countries in the Horn of Africa shift their focus from fighting over borders to improving the lives of their citizens? That's, that's the goal. So basically how are we going to shift? For example, I'm going to specifically speak about Eritrea because this is a country that I'm very, very familiar with as I'm from. Is we need to look at our neighbors as an ally. I can only find David Teferi, somebody called David Teferi only in Ethiopia. So there is no logic why I cannot sit down with an Ethiopian and make a deal that's fair for both of us. And we need to focus on that. So we, as Eritreans, we need to do a soul healing. And yes, we, there was a lot of trauma during independence, but we need to move past that. And we need to look at ways to live together with Ethiopia. And that's where it come in, is then we look back at our history and say, well, you know what? In our existence as a culture, we have more in common than we don't have um, uh, uncommonality. For example, out of the nine ethnic groups in Eritrea, six of them have families and ties in Ethiopia. That could be a big bridge for us to make peace. And moreover, I want to make a, make a, I'm going to use a metaphor my friend um, told me. He said, the Eritrean coastline is like a, a virgin guy or virgin beautiful son or daughter you have, that you're so jealous about that daughter. You're saying, I have the most beautiful daughter, but then you're so jealous, you don't want her to marry anybody else, and then it dies on your virgin. And that's what happened to our coast, you know? So what we need to do is we need to look back and say, okay, what is was the intention of having a country? Okay, I wanted to have a, I wanted to rule myself, done. So now the next step is how I can coexist with my neighbors, especially the ones I have a lot of kinship with. Uh, we have kinship with all the countries around us. Ethiopia does the same. Ethiopia is a big country with a lot of population mix. So it could become an anchor country for all the peace in the, in the, in the region. And you look back at creative ways to create creative solutions. For example, Ethiopia is able to achieve electricity surplus. That's something a country like Eritrea, Somalia would need, and we can exchange for that the coast. Um, we need to work as small countries in the, in the region here on around Ethiopia, how we can turn our region into an integrated region for economic activity. The reason in Djibouti we have seven bases of 
uh, uh, of major all the major powers is because our region is critical. Now we can infight about among ourselves and get other people to tell us what to do, or we can just make deal and work together and move forward. And this is achievable. Look at the Europeans, the Germans and the French. They fought themselves. They kill each other more than anybody else in this world. And they yet now they have open borders. So why not us, right? And where we have a lot more in common. So that's the view, because ultimately our countries are supposed to be the place where our people live in, not die for. That makes sense. In your view, what should be the long term vision for the Horn of Africa? And how can leaders in the region work together to achieve this vision? It's, I said, we need to look at the vision should be very simple. We should create um, an integrated region for, with an economic uh, uh, that built around the, uh, the natural resources that, we, uh, that the region have. And one of the biggest, it's not the natural resources, it's not the gold in, uh, in Eritrea or the potassium uh, in the, the Nike in Eritrea or the oil in Ogaden. The, the real richness is somehow Ethiopia have one of the biggest population with young population. And that should be turning Ethiopia into a manufacturing hub. The moment that happens, all the countries in the region have to be willing to become open borders, allow trade, and that will allow a lot of innovations and we can start really become an important country. We use our geography to our benefit. Um, Dubai should be there, but why not have another Dubai in Assam? Why we have to always, a ship have to go past the whole coast of Eritrea, Sudan, and Yemen, and it's passing somehow goes to Dubai to the trade. Uh, and that's that's very important for us to think about those kind of perspective and how to build a more integrated, you know, successful economically region. If you have anything to add, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, what I would say to my fellow Horn African, fellow Eritrean, fellow European, we need to look forward past toxic nationalism. We need to look at what makes us what's like our common history together and figure out a way forward. We cannot afford to go to conflict again on our colonial borders. Rather than that, is we respect them. We work on ways to improve the lives of our citizens. Uh, when I go back and I will use my country Eritrea as an example, we lived a long time under the regime he has telling us about the border issues with Badimbe, Badimbe, Badimbe in 2018. We have seen him say, oh, no need for borders, we are one people. And the people cheat because we are one people in a sense, we have a common history. We have nothing, the, the, our differences are very small. So the people were excited, but then that's not what the agenda, the agenda was to create mayhem and war. And we have seen Eritrea participating in a civil war that had no business in, so basically, but then we get, uh, then somehow now when somehow Prime Minister speaks uh, Ahmed, Abi Ahmed about uh, let's see people get excited and angry about it. Um, it kind of makes no sense. So we kind of participate in war and destruction. However, when it comes to economic progress, we don't. So we need to look at our countries and take responsibility and think about ways to make this region the most successful region in Africa, integrate it. And we need to use our history that expands three uh, thousands of years. And we need to use our looks, our, we are multi uh, part for a lot of cultures, for a lot of ways uh, of living. We should utilize that to become an economic hub for the region, rather than look at our small differences and continue to fight. And I hope this message um, get uh, get understood by the youth in Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Somaliland, wherever the political uh, derivative we have in the region. And I thank you very much, Fentahu, for the uh, for allowing me to speak my mind. I appreciate it. Thank you for your precious time and analysis. Thank you very much. Dear viewers, you have been watching Obian Horn of Africa, our weekly program, Future Africa. Thank you for watching and stay connected with other programs of OBN Horn of Africa. <music>